afternoon. Welcome everyone. Great to see you all here. We're going to call to order the city council meeting for the afternoon of April 4th. Tony, would you please call the roll? Jimenez? Present. Torres? Present. Cohen? Here. Ortiz? Present. Davis? Here. Doan? Present. Candelas? Present. Foley? Batra? Present. Kame? Here. Mayhan? Here. Thank you. Okay, if you're able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Today's invocation will be from Dean McCauley of the Sea Scouts and South Bay Yacht Club, and Councilmember Cohen will tell us more. Thank you. Uh, established in, in 1888, South Bay Yacht Club, located in Alviso, it's one of the oldest and long longest running clubs of its type in the country. The clubhouse was built in 1903 and still serves as a meeting place where many gather from around the Bay Area and is home to organizations such as the Sea Scouts, whose main focus is environmental stewardship and conservation. Many of the club's members, which included Jack London, can be seen in, in annual photos that were taken, one of which is hanging on the second floor hallway between here and City Hall from 1947. Uh, you'll see um, their uh, opening day photo. At the time, the Yacht Club stood at what, is, what was one of the busiest ports in the Bay Area, the Alviso Port. It's important, the South Bay Yacht Club is an important historical organization that brings together many generations of our diverse community holding at its core the importance of protection and preservation of our unique waterways. So I'd like to introduce Dean McCulley. He's got a couple other guests, uh, Roy Hayes, former Commodore of the Yacht Club, and Nathan McCulley, who's uh, skipper, um, skipper for the Sea Scouts. I don't know the exact title. <laughs> Skipper's mate. Skipper's mate for the Sea Scouts. Skipper's and they're, mate. they're here to uh, give a little presentation. Thank you, Council Member Cohen. Uh, let me turn this over to Roy Hayes. He's one of our, our former Commodores uh, multiple times, and he can say a little bit more than I can, and then I'll, I'll come back. Should I be facing you guys or them? You can face the audience if, if we've got the mic right here for you. Okay. Thank you. Now, can you hear me? Or does this need to raise? I'm rather tall. Ha, ah, thank you. There we go. Well, thank you for having me, having us here today. Again, my name is Roy Hayes. I'm a former Commodore of the South Bay Yacht Club. My stick just fell over. I needed to be able to stand up. That's a new addition to my life. Um, Council Member Cohen took a little by thunder. This, he told you when the Yacht Club was established. We, our first Commodore was Joseph McKee, who McKee, Ro McKee Road was named after. Uh, the clubhouse was built in 1904. We have 83 family members or family memberships. So we also have two corporate memberships. We, you don't need to be, you don't need to have a boat to be a member of the yacht club. We have given the fact that we have 83 members and we only have like six boats at the dock. It kind of speaks for itself. It's more of a social club. We do have active dock space. It is a, we do have space available. If anyone wants to put a boat there, please talk to me or Dean or Nathan over there. <laughs> um, most of what we do is a, it's a social activity. We have something that goes on once a week. We have a group of people that do kayaking the first Saturday of every month. You don't need to be a member of the Yacht Club to be involved with the kayaking. It's really a lot of fun. We get together about eight o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning and kayak out the slough or back up towards Tasman. We head towards the city of San Jose sometimes. We do rent the club out. I'm also the rental manager if you need to rent the club. And we offer a full bar. And uh, we sponsor a Sea Scout ship, which Nathan will talk about in a little bit. And we also are, the, we're the venue for a summer camp that allows local kids to come and learn about environmental issues uh, in and around the area. And with that, I'll, I think my minute is probably up so Dean can take over. Let me get my stick. No. Don't hit me with it. 
<laughs> okay. So, yes, thanks, Roy. Um, we do keep busy up there in El Viso. Everybody knows where El Viso is, right? It's actually San Jose, but don't tell the locals that. So we do first Saturday kayaking. Like Roy said, we've got 30 kayaks up there, uh, all free. So 9 o'clock on a Saturday, first Saturday of the month, come on up. We take a lot of kids out. Let's see. We've got on May 8th, uh, Mother's Day, we're doing the opening day on the South Day. So we're actually the PICYA, which is the Pacific Intercoastal Yachting Club Association. We're the representative. We're the furthest south uh, yacht club in, in the entire galaxy of Bay Area yacht clubs, a couple hundred of us, I think. Um, and then we've got Veterans Day on 4th of July. So if you're a veteran, come on up for free. We have a big several hundred person party celebration for that. And then we do summer camp from, I believe it's July 10th through 26th this year. Um, we've got grants from Zanker Recycling, which is now Green Waste, to get a lot of local kids. I think we had 50 local kids learning things like kayaking, photography, uh, uh, bird watching, uh, videography, Whole bunch of stuff we actually did woodworking last year we added a bicycling component so we got donations for bicycles so the kids learned to bicycle and then they got to take home a free bike after three weeks they learned how to fix the bikes and that's cool so that spawned a lot of things so um with that said about come on up nathan uh six years ago we started a sea scout unit there and uh to serve the local community i think we're up to about 15 scouts now give or take and um we take a lot of kids between 14 and 21, again, kayaking, sailing, they're getting sailing lessons for free. We're taking them scuba diving, all kinds of things. So anybody is welcome to come up and do that. So let me introduce Nathan, our uh, inaugural um, Sea Scout founder. So come on up, Nathan. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nathan McCulley, and I am the one of the co-founders of the Sea Scout ship, um, or Sea Scout unit, uh, founded in El Viso. I'm one of the skipper's mates, so I'm one of the adult leaders. Uh, unit th uh, 300 actually has been going very strong. We're about 15 members, uh, 15 scouts uh, strong at this point, and... Uh, we actually, as a unit, have been quite active in our communities. We have... Um, done events in such organizations as the Sil Silicon Valley Water, Santa Clara Valley Water District, District, the San Francisco Bay Birding Observatory, and also have been doing a little bit of work with the uh, an organization called Compass Point Mentorship um, as well uh, through the summer camp that was mentioned. Uh, and we've participated as a ship, have participated in such activities as uh, creek cleanups, uh, which are around the uh, San Francisco uh, Bay Area, El Viso Slough, where Sea Scouts call home, uh, making snowy plover habitats um, uh, through mud stop or annual mud stops, and abandoned uh, salt production ponds, and teaching uh, kayaking to kids through summer camp through the CP mentorship as well. And I would kind of like to finish, uh, finish just with a quote from Lord Baden-Powell, who is the father of, the, of scouting. Our father, make us trustworthy, for there, are those, uh, for there are those who trust us. Make us loyal for those, um, or for through loyalty, we are able to reach our highest ideals. Uh, teach us to be helpful. For through helpfulness, do we forget our selfness? And last but not least, make us friendly. For there are those who need a friend. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate those words of wisdom. We are on to ceremonial items of Councilmember Cohen, Kerry Romanow, and our. Um, Climate Smart Champions would like to join me at the podium. We will recognize Earth Day. We're not that tall. <laughs> Thanks. Very much. 
Thank you. Okay, great. So today we are recognizing April as Earth Month and April 22nd as Earth Day. And as uh, I'm sure you all know, my colleague, Councilor Cohen, has been a really strong champion of the of a variety of environmental issues in his time on the council. So I'd like to invite him to say a few words about what this means, and then I'll I'll come back to help recognize some of our climate smart champions who will be receiving individual awards today. Councilor Cohen. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> uh, we can often feel. <clears throat> oh, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, through my throat. We can often feel overwhelmed by the magnitude of the climate crisis. Our individual actions are important, but the only way to make progress is through larger scale institutional and governmental change. Cities like San Jose can provide the model by which collective action can lead us out of this crisis. And I'm thankful for the strong leadership of our environmental services department and climate smart team. In fact, I just call out uh, Carrie Romanow here with us. She'll be receiving recognition this year for individual leadership at the 2023 Climate Leadership Awards. All of us on council recognize the moral imperative of urgent action but with all the other challenges we face, climate often becomes a lesser priority. We must continue to prioritize our planet. During Earth Month, we should rededicate ourselves to being leaders in this fight. <clears throat> and our commitment is not just to the planet, it's to our children's generation. I continue to be <clears throat> inspired by the youth who continually remind us of the importance of urgent action. They weren't the cause of our climate emergency, but they are the ones who will have to live with the effects. And we do this for them. That's why we must phase out our use of fossil fuels, whether for heating our homes, generating electricity, powering our vehicles, or making plastics. I will continue to look for ways to move beyond these old technologies. <clears throat> Fortunately, there are alternatives, and our role as a city is to facilitate the transition to electrification. San Jose is leading the nation by being bold and setting goals and making demonstrable progress on them. Our goal is to be carbon neutral by 2030, and we're the first large city in the U.S. to make that commitment. We should be extremely proud of our work uh, that we've done so far and the example we've set for our regional partners in major cities across the country. While fighting climate change and reaching carbon neutrality can seem like an insurmountable task, our progress and our comprehensive plan of action have shown that it is possible and worth the effort and investment. And to help us get there, we'll be starting a climate commission in the next few months to involve the voices of our community in the process. And I'm proud to be in a city that's at the forefront of this transition and I'm happy today to be honoring members of our community who are leaders in this climate fight, who are climate champions for the city of San Jose. No, Harry, come on. Thank you, council member. So first we've got, it's a little complicated. We're, uh, we're doing a proclamations. We're proclaiming Earth Day. Thank you, thank you Councilman Cohen, for those great words. I'm gonna hand this to, to Carrie. You sure you don't want to say a few words? Come on, say something about Climate Smart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Mahan and Councilmember uh, Cohen. Um, I, on behalf of all city staff and our community, um, thank you all for working so hard on Climate Smart and for just being a... Uh, great leaders in uh, in our help to make the world better as we go forward. So, so thank you all. And please go out and do something for Earth Day. Thank you, Carrie. Enacted in 2018, Climate Smart San Jose is a community-wide initiative to reduce air pollution, save water, and improve quality of life while meeting the greenhouse gas emission reduction targets of the Paris Agreement. The success of Climate Smart depends on effective partnerships between the city, and our residents, community groups, nonprofits, businesses, and other organizations within San Jose. The Climate Smart Champion Awards recognize San Jose individuals and organizations who have made outstanding contributions to achieving the sustainability goals of Climate Smart. It is my pleasure to recognize this year's Climate Smart Champions for their outstanding work to protect our health, environment, and economy. I'm going to ask Councilor Cohen if he can help. We have a number of commendations here, and I'll read off the names. Now, we do have a couple of our Climate Smart uh, or Climate Champions were unable to join us today. So I'm going to just mention them, and then I'll get to our others who are here in person. So first, our Youth Climate Champion, Mila Beckel. Unfortunately, Mila will not be in attendance, but we will make sure she receives her commendation. 
And for the mobility champion, we have Emily Schwing of Veggie Lucian. And unfortunately, Emily's also not able to be here, but her, I believe her colleagues, Abigail Heinsen and Maricela Fuentes are here. Is that correct? Awesome. Thank you, guys. So we'll make, I assume you'll get that over to Emily. Thank you for being here. And thanks for your collective work at Veggie Lucian. We also have our water conservation champion, and we have Alan Hackler of Bay Maples Wild California Gardens. We can give him his commendation. And then for our energy champion, we have Meta, which is Mujeres Empresarias Tomando Acción, represented by Araceli Sierra. Thank you to our Meta folks. And then we have our climate equity champion. We have the Zen Pilot Community Partner, Project Hope, represented by Maria Sid. And we have the McLaughlin Area Tenants Neighborhood Association, represented by Rosario Aguirre. Good job keeping up with all this, council member. And then finally, we have our climate champion of the year, none other than our bishop, Bishop Oscar Cantu of the Roman Catholic Diocese of San Jose. Bishop, would you like to say a few words? You're the champion of the year. I feel like that entitles you to <laughs> dispense some wisdom. Thank you for being here. Sure. Um, ju just to thank you to the, the leadership of Pope Francis, uh, I'm sure you were aware when he, he published um, the first encyclical, um, uh, a global document from, from, from his vantage point, from his authority, uh, on, uh, on the environment, the fact that this is our common home. And uh, I want to thank the, the stewards of our common home here in San Jose, uh, a committee that, that we have who kind of uh, prompt me to, to do the right thing. Um, but also, in my, my previous life, I was um, involved in some international work uh, a few years ago and realized that, um, that climate change causes uh, people to, to immigrate, whether it's from the, the islands of Oceania, whether it's in Central Africa, or whether it's in Central America because the climate changes, they're no, no longer able to grow their crops or their islands are disappearing in the midst of the, the, South, uh, the South Pacific. And so um, this is not an American issue, this is a global issue. And so we all have a responsibility to it. Glad to be part of the solution. Thank you, Mayor. So once again, I just, I really want to thank everybody up here, all of our community leaders and organizations. You know, we in government can set a direction and a big lofty goal and say, here's where we know we need to go and we can support that with new rules and policies and programs. But ultimately, a crisis of this magnitude requires, as, as the bishop just said, collective action it requires everybody in civil society, everybody in the community to make changes small and large to help move us in that direction. So that's really what this is about, is recognizing just the outstanding contributions of many community members. So I wanna thank you all once again. We're gonna take a big group photo, but first please join me in giving all of our climate champions here a big round of applause.
All right, we're moving on to orders of the day. Does anyone on the council have any changes to the printed agenda? Okay, seeing none, do we have a motion? So moved. Okay, moved and seconded. Second. Second, do we have public comment? There are no hands. Okay, then let's vote. Jimenez. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. <coughs> Is there anybody over the age of 18 with you? Uh, unless we're including dogs in dog years, no. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Doan? Aye. Candelas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Batra? <laughs> yes. Kamei? <laughs> Aye. Mahan. Aye. And, and just to note, uh, one of the requirements of AB 2449 is the remote person needs to state whether somebody over the age of 18 is present with them for every single vote and their relationship to the person who is over the age of 18. Tony? Yes. I am in a room by myself with the door closed. Can we just say now that I will let you know if someone is in here, but otherwise we can assume that no one is in here? The language of the bill says you have to state it every time, but I'm gonna let, like if Nora disagrees with me, she can chime in. It, uh, thank you, um, Tony, It's an, and council member, it's a new provision, um, and we don't have a whole lot of guidance on it. It's very prescriptive, but I think for right now, we probably should follow it. You can, you can just say no one as you, um, as you vote, but we probably ought to be careful with it for right now. Thanks. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're on to the closed session report. Nora? Thank you, Mayor. We do not have a report out of closed session today. Great, thank you. Okay, consent calendar. Are there any items that the council would like to pull from the consent calendar? Mayor, uh, I'd like to pull 2.7 out. Uh, which is the San Jose Clean Energy Summary, uh, Summer 2023 Demand Resources Pro Response Program. Okay, and that was 2.17? 2.7, sorry. 2.7, yeah. Okay, okay, great. Uh, why don't we take that item first then? Did you, is there anything else? Doesn't look like it, okay. Did you wanna go ahead and comment on that? Oh, uh, I would like uh, staff, if somebody is here, to really just describe it. I want to highlight this activity, so the purpose is to get somebody from the staff to say something about it. We can do that. I'd ask uh, Lori Mitchell from Clean Energy to come down. And just as Lori's coming down, council member, did, I'm sorry, did you say you wanted a summary or did you no, have a specific question? Uh, I, no, I just want to basically highlight to the public such a program exists and, and the value of this because it's a clean energy activity. So, so I don't have any objection to anything. I just want to make sure that this thing uh, is described to the public. Okay, that's what I'm wondering though. We want Lori to give a very quick summary of what it is. Yeah, that's right. Sure, and thank you, Council Member. Lori Mitchell, Director of Community Energy. This program is a demand response program which helps our customers reduce energy during very hot days in the summer, and that helps reduce our power supply costs, but it also helps reduce their electricity bills. Is it only limited to the commercial users, or it is for the commercial and the residential users? Yeah, right now we are focused on commercial users as they are high energy users so that we can reduce that peak demand that we see on hot summer days. But we do anticipate rolling out programs to residential customers in the future. And, and this is only uh, first time we are doing it or this is a continuation of some program? Uh, this is the first time we're doing this version of demand response. In the past, we have done other types of demand response to customers, like giving out smart thermostats and things like that to reduce energy usage during the summer. Right. Thanks for being creative and trying to reduce the uh, energy impact and uh, making clean energy more clean. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Uh, Councilor, would you like to make a motion? Uh, yes, uh, accept the 
the proposal as uh, uh, described. W would you be okay taking the consent calendar as a whole? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, ex motion Great. to accept it. Great. Calendar. Seconded by the vice mayor. Thank you, council member. Do we have public comment? Claire Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I just saw that there was uh, two board and commission appointments coming up uh, on on the Clean Energy uh, Community Advisory Commission uh, and Measure T Commission. Uh, really interesting commissions in San Jose that I think along with the, uh, the Housing uh, Commission that uh, does some really interesting work in San Jose and I invite everyone to want to uh, go to their commission meetings, check, check them out, and uh, they do some really interesting good work. The airport commission also does some really interesting good work uh, within San Jose that I think has really helped, really helped shape uh, really good policies for San Jose overall. That uh, I know it's always a question how that can actually happen in the commission process, but uh, it's nice when it does, and those, those commissions uh, seem to really have a, a way to be doing that and I just wanted to thank them for their work and to remind ourselves at this meeting. Thank you. Back to council. Great. Thanks, Tony. And Tony, before I forget, uh, if because I'm not in the Zoom, if Councilmember Davis is raising her hand at any point in the meeting, will you just flag yeah. me? Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Do we have any further council discussion? I don't see any hands up, so I think we're ready to vote. Jimenez? Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Yes. Davis? Yes, and I am alone. Doan? <laughs> Aye. Candelas? <laughs> yes. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Kame? Aye. Aye. Mayhan? Aye. Thank you. That was fantastic. Okay. Um, um, we are. Jimenez needs to, he wants to register his Aye. vote. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're on to item 3.1, report of the city manager. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I have no report today. Thank you. Okay, item 3.3, .3, which is the annual summary of upcoming labor negotiations. Do we have no presentation? Okay. Let's see any hands. No questions, no hands. Do we have a motion? Move to accept the report. Second. Right. No, the second was Councilman Condellis. Thank you. Okay. Do we have public comment? Paul Soto. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Labor negotiations should never be uh, just passed the way that it was now. Just motion, seconded, and then it'll get minuted and then passed. Labor negotiations are a critically important function of city government because that's taxpayer money. All every single labor negotiation that this city engages itself in is the people's money. So the people have a fiduciary interest in ensuring where does this money go? Who is it going to? Why is it going to? Is it justified? Is it rationalized? Because I don't trust my government. I don't trust you. I don't, and you have given me no reason to trust you as a citizen. Absolutely none. In fact, you have given me every single reason to doubt the legitimacy and your ability to justly and legitimately govern this city, considering that the city is predicated upon the decapitations of Native Americans that still has yet to be amended and properly discussed in an open public forum. And this has everything to do with labor relations. Why? Because if you still have not squared that historical debt that San Jose owes to the Native American and the Mexican, then how is it that you are going to enter negotiations with laborers and labor contractors and general contractors and we can trust that you are going to square deal with no discussion? No, I think that's unacceptable. And I would like a presentation with anything that has to do with taxpayer money in the way that it's. Back to council. Great, thank you. 
Let's see any hands, so I'll assume we are ready to vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes, and I am alone. Cohen? Aye. Still. <laughs> Candelas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes, and okay. I'm not alone. <laughs> Kame? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to item 3.4, which is the Spring Intergovernmental Relations Report, and I believe we have a short presentation. Okay. All right, we'll just wait for folks to get down to the box. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Council Members, and members of the public. My name is Sarah Sarate, Director of the Office of Administration, Policy, and Intergovernmental Relations. I'm joined today by the Intergovernmental Relations team, including Zane Barnes, Kaylin Kenny, and Steve Stamos, um, and the federal and state lobbying partners, Lori Henger, who's gonna be on Zoom, from Holland and Knight, and Steve Cruz and Stephanie Estrada, who's in the audience from Cruz Strategies. Today's spring report uh, provides a recap of the city's legislative priorities, a brief overview of recent developments at the federal and state levels, a quick review of some of the city's priority bills, and an update on our advocacy efforts. The list of bills we discussed today is only a short list. Uh, there's a lot more context found in state and federal legislative logs, which are the attachments A and B IGR's work is extensive. This, is, um, this slide is our attempt to summarize our work since December. Our work is all about partnerships, networks, and collaboration. By working with internal and external teams, over $830 million was brought to the region in various forms of federal, state, and regional funding. We're currently tracking over 250 state and federal bills, several of which the city has taken a position on. Since December, we've issued over 50 advocacy letters for legislation, grant funding, and advocating for the city's priorities. We are currently sponsoring three bills in the state legislature and have facilitated strong commentary at three state legislative committees, which are just getting started. And of course, there's the daily work of representing our city's interests in many, many meetings with legislators and partner agencies. I am now pleased to hand it off to Zane, but also wanna recognize that our work is only possible due to the engaged department subject matter experts, as well as our partners in the mayor's office, Ryan Coonerty and Mackenzie Mosing. Thanks, Sarah. Um, here are our five legislative priorities as, appro as approved by council in December 2022, along with the enterprise priorities which they are nested. These priorities inform how IGR focuses the city's advocacy resources, and in no particular order, they are promoting safety in Vision Zero, addressing homelessness and expanding affordable housing, pursuing infrastructure funding, driving impactful climate change, and being a relentless advocate for San Jose families. The president released his proposed budget on March 9th, and some of the highlights include $5 trillion in new taxes while reducing the federal deficit by nearly $3 billion over the next 10 years, $59 billion to increase affordable housing, $21 billion to support the Chips and Sciences Act implementation, $6 billion to support Ukraine, and over a billion dollars to, to combat climate change through decarbonization. In addition, there's an additional $500 million that was included to BART Silicon Valley. 
However, with a divided Congress, we're anticipating some tense budget negotiations and expect that the budget that is finally approved will look substantially different than what the President released in March. We want to highlight some additional legislation at the federal level that is of interest to the city. The National Defense Authorization Act was approved in December, which included the Water Resources Development Act, which authorizes the Army Corps of Engineers activities. Most importantly, the act included language which restored the federal cost share for Valley Water's shoreline levy project, which unlocked a significant amount of money for funding to keep the project moving. Moreover, the Consolidated Appropriations Act was also passed in December, which funds the federal government through September, and notably included the largest ever investment in non-defense spending of $787 billion. Also, reauthorization of the FAA is currently underway and needs to be passed by September. The San Jose International Airport is following this closely. Finally, the federal government, through the Treasury Department, has begun to take significant steps to prevent default on the nation's debt. Negotiations to increase this debt ceiling appear to be stalled for the moment, but should give, gain steam as we get closer to summer when it is anticipated we will hit the debt ceiling. The IGR team takes a forward-leaning stance on the state budget as well. We sent a letter advocating for our priorities before the governor's January proposed budget, and we'll send another letter ahead of the May revise. When the governor's budget was released, there was an estimated $22.5 billion shortfall. This may grow to $30 billion, but this is hard to estimate due to the, ta the de delay in tax filing. The budget still did not have deep cuts to ongoing programs, and some highlights include a billion dollars for the fifth round of, HAP, of the HAP program, three and a half million to provide Narcan to middle and high schools, and transportation cuts um, to the TRCP program, and $200 million less in the active transportation program. The, city, the IGR team is working diligently to advance three pieces of city-sponsored legislation this session. SB 400 on termination disclosure would enable police departments to disclose basic information about officer termination for misconduct. This bill was brought, fired, brought forward to increase transparency. AB 645 on automated speed enforcement is being sponsored by Assemblymember Friedman. This bill is another attempt to enable automated speed enforcement. It would be a pilot of five cities, including San Jose. We work diligently to address the privacy and equity considerations in this new piece of legislation. SB 8 on firearm liability insurance is sponsored by Senator Blake Spear. This bill would create a statewide farm firearm liability insurance requirement, and we've been working on, on this with the author's office to mirror the city's gun harm reduction ordinance. <clears throat> Over the 250, of the 250 bills we're monitoring, there are a few highlights organized by legislative priority. In housing and homelessness, SB 634 involves emergency interim housing streamlining and is being monitored by our team. We're in support of AB 1469 to expand Valley, Valley Water's scope to address homelessness. In safety and vision zero, we're hoping to kill another bill around police uh, radio encryption, SB 719. In equitable and resilient infrastructure, we're supporting AB 939 to amend the Water District Act to allow additional opportunities for financing at Valley Water. In terms of climate action, we supported SB 511, which would help local governments address climate change. And finally, <clears throat> and in addressing equitable outcomes and prosperity for families, we supported Senator Cortese's bill to increase overdose prevention efforts in schools and Senator Eggman's SB 43 on conservatorship reform. The IGR team recently successfully partnered with other agencies to secure resources for the city. We partnered with Valley Transportation on $742 million in transit intercity rail program, which includes $375 million for BART Silicon Valley Phase 2, and $367 million to fully fund Caltrain electrification. Moreover, we advocated with Valley Water to secure $91.2 million for the Shoreline Levy Project. This project is crucial to addressing the city's regional wastewater facility and Alviso neighborhood from sea level rise. Moreover, we will continue to our advocacy efforts to support city revenue by advocating for table growth for our two card rooms and the opposition to the Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act, which came to council a few weeks ago. This concludes our presentation. We're asking the council to accept the spring IGR report and reaffirm the city positions in the federal and state legislative locks. And with that, we're available for questions. Great, thank you. Appreciate the 
work you do, I've had the opportunity in this role to see up close just how much work is done behind the scenes to advocate for our city at the state and federal level. And while we have a small IGR team, I, I know you all work incredibly hard and are good at your job. So thank you for the presentation. We'll come back to council discussion, but do we have public comment? Paul Soto followed by Blair. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. In the six years that I have been doing advocacy work in this city, PIS, PIS, neighborhoods, city council, uh, board of supervisors, I have never heard someone speak with so many words that have empty meaning. There was no content there. There was a bunch of words and absolutely no substance. That is an art form, and I tip my brim to you, homeboy, because you perfected the ability to lie to the people with a smile on your face. That's what you accomplished in that presentation. Well, we can't direct number, comments number to anyone in particular. I, did, I didn't, hey, hey, just calm down, man. I already know about Jackie. The cops already came at me, so calm yourself down, Mayor. Calm yourself. Blair? Um, Blair, oh, sorry, we accidentally lowered Blair's hand. Hi, thank you for noticing my hand. Uh, I, I put it back up and uh, thank you. Something turned me off there. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, I wanted to comment on, uh, I think uh, overall, uh, uh, with federal funding dollars that are that are coming in in a, in a pretty huge amount, pretty large amount for uh, sewer upgrade issues and, and rainwater, stormwater runoff issues. Um, it's been uh, quite a winter and a thank you that we're being getting, we're getting these federal dollars uh, now. Uh, interestingly, San Diego, where I'm currently living is receiving the same but federal funding dollars in the same sort of package, same sort of way, and uh, which is nice. And, and I'm really happy and glad for that. Uh, the city of Oakland, meanwhile, is not getting these good federal funding dollars in this crisp system of just immediate help. And I don't know why exactly that is. And I hope you can help Oakland in some way to whatever they're going through to, with these issues. Um, and, and to really note that we have to be very honest that uh, there is real bay level, sea level rise issues happening around the bay and all around the bay. And that we're not honest enough about that subject matter. And I, I hope we can make the efforts to be. And with Vision Zero ideas, uh, as always, a good luck that we talk about uh, Vision Zero practices openly and accountable, accountably and that we address the statistics issue openly and accountably. Uh, and with my remaining time, good luck how we can address the SJPOA recent issues with possible OCLEM ideas. Uh, thank you. Back to council. Thank you. Councilor Dwan. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, staff, for your hard work. We are tasked with reaffirming council position made by last year's city council. But one of those positions is promote safety and vision zero initiative. Was focused solely on vehicle collusion as well as only violence from firearms. As a former fire captain, I understand that our public safety needs in San Jose are much more than just traffic collusion and firearms violence. And our direction to IGR should reflect that our city need desperately to hire more police officer, paramedic, developing and improving program to deter youth from gangs, drugs, and other dangerous activities such as SJYEA. The ability to, pro to prosecute individuals who violate the law especially those who break firearm laws, building and funding facility to care for our neighbors with mental 
health needs. I propose a slight modification to the language of a council position. Promote safety and Vision Zero initiative to include the following additional language as detailed in my memorandum. Also supporting initiative and funding to reduce violence and harm from firearms, hire more first responder, prosecute crime which are impact our resident, visitor, and businesses, address our mental health needs, and support program to support our at news risk. Therefore, I move for our council to adopt my memorandum. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Go to Councilor Cohen. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I just, I just wanted to quickly say thank you to the IGR team. Um, you know, as I've been interacting with a lot of people from other cities, and I was just on a trip with people from Bay Area, from 15 Bay Area cities a couple weeks ago, and I'm um, on, uh, when I go to the, the meetings at the Cal Cities, um, I want people to understand how fortunate we are to have an RGR team that advocates on our behalf and, and works with the, city, the state legislators and, uh, advocates for funding from the federal government and state government. Most cities don't have their own internal teams. Most cities rely on some third parties to do that advocacy for them. So I, I just wanna thank you for the important work you're doing um, and, and thank you for really narrowing in on what our key priorities need to be and what pieces of legislation are important for us to follow. So I just wanted to say that and thank you and I was uh, gonna move the staff recommendation. Second. Okay, Councilor Torres, was, was, did you have the second? Okay, great. I just wasn't looking that way. Wanted to make sure I had it right. Thanks, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Foley. Wonderful, thank you so much for the presentation. I really uh, appreciate the briefing that I had yesterday with you and the <laughs> additional information today is always helpful. I know you're watching a lot of things at the state and federal level as we should be. It's a huge agenda of things that might impact us one way or the other, and it's important to have a, our team as small and mighty as you are, and I do appreciate all the work that you're uh, doing there. I have a couple of questions for you uh, regarding specific items, and I just wanted to get an idea as to the status of them. The first one is, you already mentioned it, is AB 645 Friedman, Automated Speed Enforcement. How is that going? Thank you for it's the question. It's kind of the San Jose Amendment, right? That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member uh, Sarah Sadat, the Director of API. Um, so as you may recall, last summer we received direction from Council to really focus on this bill. Uh, and we strongly advocated for its reintroduction uh, in coordination with other cities um, and have had San Jose delegation members um, be added to the bill. Uh, the bill author also did a lot of additional outreach over the last several months before its introduction and included some additional amendments as compromises. Um, we do still have a strong opposition from PORAC uh, which we understand um, they're requesting that two cities, San Jose and Oakland, be taken off as pilot cities. There's only a handful of cities that are already in the bill. San Jose is one of them, and they're requesting that we be taken off. Um, and we understand that this is uh, actually rooted in our own POA um, pushing for opposition through PORAC. So we're still very much um, advocating for the bill on behalf of the city, but, but we do face some opposition. So to follow up to that, you're suggesting that our POA is working at counter purposes with our city direction. Why is that? Is, is that what you're saying? I'm sorry, uh, council member, can you rephrase the question? Sorry. Restate well, I thought it. that Sarah said that the opposition in part in removing the city of San Jose is coming from opposition that the author has received from the POA. That's correct. 
Pork why products. would they be objecting to this? Our, our understanding, I don't know if it's a policy rationale, but our understanding is those are the two city departments that PORAC represents the officers. I, it wasn't a policy, but I understand I, that was the I rationale. can jump in. Yeah. To, I, after the direction last year, I engaged the Police Officers Association and then did a few weeks ago, as we were hearing from the author about the request for removal, um, and the Police Officers Association didn't want to engage in the conversation until we were going to have a more meaningful conversation about staffing in the department and staffing within the Traffic Enforcement Unit. Can you expand on that for me, Lee? You know, th honestly, that, that was, the conversation was pretty quick and pretty abrupt. Th that's what was said. I feel um, there's concern that this legislation would be replacing police officers and not uh, viewing it as, An you know, enhanced services to the community as we would see it. I, th I feel like, you know, the, they definitely don't, um, are not looking at it as an additional tool in their tool belt uh, around safety and throughout the city. Wow, okay, because I consider it another tool in the toolbox on how we can be more efficient with the limited resources we have, particularly when we have high pedestrian deaths that are a result of people speeding. We know that speed is directly related to the high level of fatalities we have on our streets. Last year we had 65. Just recently a woman was crossing Blossom Hill Road and, and killed. Uh, so I'm having, and caught by license plate readers, by the way. Um, it was, I, I mean, I know these are not license plate readers, but so I'm very concerned about that and wondering, well, maybe we should take this offline and have a conversation about what well, to do at a, a later date. But it seems like this is really important for us to pursue. I would uh, just, you know, I I plan on following up. Um, I forget when, when we're here. The, the the bill's going to be heard in two weeks, so I plan on following up with the POA before then, uh, one more time to see what we can do. But happy happy to also see if council direction around that again if the council feels that that's necessary. Maybe we could have a conversation offline too, Lee, before you just so I can seek to have more understanding about it. Of course. Thank you. And are there any co-authors on this bill? Uh, yes, there are. Um, I can mention some of them, but Assemblymember uh, Ting, as San Francisco, is uh, part of the pilot, and uh, Senator Weiner, and then, uh, as uh, Sarah mentioned, uh, Assemblymember Berman and Lee, in, representing the San Jose area, and then Haney and Assemblymember Buffy Wicks from Oakland. Haney, San Francisco, Wicks, Oakland. Assemblyman Berman is the sign, sign on Correct. this? Oh, good, Correct. thank yes. you, that's good to know, okay. All right, I'm gonna change, fo thank you, I appreciate that. Changing focus a little bit. Um, what is the status of AB 251, which is the vehicle weight and injury study? What's the status of that? And also AB 413, uh, these are both Vision Zero type uh, uh, proposals moving through the assembly of which I'm very con very concerned as the Vision Zero Chair. It, the 413 Lee is a 20-foot buffer around crosswalks. Also seems like a really good idea, so what are the status of those and likelihood they'll get through? Well, I can at least speak, to, Sarah, to the um, AB 251 by Assemblymember Ward from San Diego, uh, the vehicle weight safety. That bill has not been set for hearing, okay. uh, it would be heard in the Transportation Committee and uh, no date yet set at this point. Okay. Um, yep. And council member, um, if you'd like, we're, we're trying to do it on the spot. I so understand. For the you bills, we could also me. follow up and, and give you more information That'd immediately be great. afterwards. That'd Thank be great. Uh, and then uh, finally, I really appreciate SB 411, Portantino's work on the Brown Act that would modify the current interpretation of virtual meetings as it relates to our boards and commissions. It's a priority on the state legislation log, but we haven't, in, in the packet you sent to us, we haven't taken a position. So maybe today is the time for us to take a position and I'd like to 
uh, I'll move for a friendly amendment in just a minute. Um, but I'm wondering how we go about making sure that it includes how, how we, how, first of all, I want to say how important this is. We have a real problem having some of our commissioners fi commissions filled now that we're back in person and we're qu requiring them to be back in person. And they're concerned, the commissioners uh, are concerned about their health. They may be immunocompromised and they don't uh, feel safe coming in to City Hall anymore. They also don't feel safe participating virtually where they have to report their location. So how, how is that proceeding and what can we do to make sure that it goes forward? Thank you very much, Council Member. Um, as of uh, this morning, we actually drafted a letter in support of this bill and we're getting ready to submit that, I believe, today. Um, we do have authority within the legislative program and, and the council has uh, commented on these issues with the Brown Act before. Um, and we do believe that it is um, a bill that supports um, accessibility, uh, which is really important to, to this council as well. Um, could you comment on where the bill is right now? Sure, thank you. Uh, Zane Barnes, uh, Chief Intergovernmental Relations Officer. It has yet to be set for a hearing, but we're monitoring it very closely. But we got our support letter in in time for it to be uh, reflected in the analysis. Wonderful, thank you very much. I'm watching that very closely, as we probably all are, given the la lack of being able to establish quorum and also the inability of our commissioners to come and do their work when they really want to do their work. I mean, this completely affects not just the senior commission, but I'm very focused on the senior commission as one that might not be able to fulfill their duties, and I know that they want to. So thank you very, very much. With that, I'm very much in support of the motion and the work that you done, do. I am so appreciative and grateful. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Council Member. Council Member Davis? Thank you, Mayor. I just want to um, echo Council Member Foley's comments about the automated speed enforcement bill. Um, I know that we've, I just want to reiterate my support for that. I know this is probably the fifth or sixth time that we've tried to get this through. And I agree that it's it's another tool in our toolbox. I, I don't think there's any possible way this could replace officers. We are so understaffed and continue to be understaffed and will continue to be understaffed even if we add 30 police officers a year um, or more uh, as as budget allows so i just want to add my uh, add my thoughts to that and and say whatever we can do or whatever i can do to help support that bill's passage this year please let me know um, I have one question for you. I was looking at Councilmember Dewan's um, proposed additions, and I'd like to get your thoughts, Sarah, Zane, and staff, um, about those proposed additions. Are they things that we're already doing, even though they're not um, listed out, items that we're already supporting? Thank you, Council Member. Um, I did just review the amended language, and these are, I think, all covered in the legislative program under the section Safer San Jose. Okay, thank you. That was what I suspected. So I think that um, we don't, we maybe don't need to include them as explicitly as they as they are done here because they are included in the larger program. Would that be fair to characterize it that way, Sarah? Yes, I, I think that's a fair characterization. Okay, great. Um, and I'll be supporting the motion on the floor. I did want to ask, in case I missed it, I'm sorry, Council Member Foley, I thought you said you were going to ask for a friendly amendment and I didn't hear it. I, I don't think I need to made it, make it because staff already submitted a letter in support of it today. Okay, perfect. Great. Thanks. Thank you. 
Thanks, Council Member. Thank on the clarification you just asked for, just so everybody's clear, the motion, as I understand it, simply includes accepting the staff report and all that's contained within it and does not make any modifications, at least currently, through friendly amendments or other memos. It is only inclusive of the staff report. Also appreciate your comments on the automated traffic enforcement and strongly agree that uh, this is a valuable tool, particularly at a time when we're seeing rising pedestrian, cyclist, and other traffic-related injuries and deaths. And uh, I don't think use of them in any way is going to change our very significant need for increased staffing in the police department for a variety of public safety needs. Um, let me move on to Council Member Batra. <coughs> Um, your work is highly appreciated that you got $833 million. Uh, next time, I think you'll bring in $1.83 million uh, billion, okay? So uh, I get some specific questions on your AB 1532, which is uh, the bill which is going to allow conversion of office building to residential building. Uh, is is like, there a question, Councilman? Yeah, the question is, um, in all the time we've been talking about here is that we want more office, more commercial. San Jose's biggest need for having the tax base to be properly growing. This one looks like is giving a complete blanket authority to the people that they can convert commercial or office buildings into residential, even though I love to have more residential here, uh, but I want that to be with the permission of City of San Jose. Uh, what do you see in this bill? Is this going against our needs and wishes? Thank you very much, Council Member. Um, we've been evaluating AB 1532 as it's moved through the legislative process. Uh, I think staff has legitimate concerns about what this could do to employment land uh, in terms of our, the conversion. Um, and perhaps somebody from maybe Jackie or, or Nancy can talk about the specifics uh, regarding the concerns. But it is currently right now, Council Member, under review. We're monitoring and working with staff to understand the implications. Yeah. Nancy Klein, Director of Economic Development. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Yes, um, the team of staff is concerned about the conversion of office. And at the same time, we're also keenly aware that particularly in the downtown, the zoning in throughout the downtown is downtown core, which already allows either. So technically through our own code as it stands, an owner could do either commercial or residential. So oh. it, it, it is unfortunately not a cut and dried answer uh, from San Jose's point of view. Okay. So so you said we are still evaluating whether to support it or not support it or let it ride on its own. That's right. Okay. All right. So we don't need. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And the AB 1033, which is to allow the sale of the ADUs uh, separately from the rest of the house uh, or the other residential part of the home. What do you see as the impact on uh, if it goes through in terms of the revenues for the city, the transfer taxes, and the capital gains side of the story? Is that all flushed out in this, uh, this bill, AB 1033? Uh, yeah, uh, Steve Cruz, uh, council member. I don't know if staff, um, internal staff had any comments on, on the policy in response to some of your questions, but I do know that there have been a lot of conversations around that where the intent of the bill has been well received in, term of, in terms of creating like separate home ownership opportunities, but there have been a lot of questions with respect to you know, title, ownership, financing, liability, how do you, you know, separate a parcel and address those issues. Um, 
at the same time. So I know there's a lot of conversations around those, but I don't know just in terms of the policy from the city perspective, but those issues that you raised um, have been a large part of the conversation in Sacramento. All right, so, so we haven't taken any position on it or any clarifications on it or any suggestions on it. Uh, Council member, we're, we're currently working with the mayor's office uh, on this one for a potential support. Okay. It does have um, an opt-in portion to the bill, um, which seems, I, I don't know, Kaylin, if you could, uh, oh, Nancy's coming, no. Kaylin, so. <laughs> 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 if you could comment. <laughs> sure, Kaylin Kenny, um, Intergovernmental Relations. So housing did um, look at this bill for us, so they might have additional comments, but it would be an opt-in provision. So the city would be able to opt in to allow for these ADU sales as separate from the main house. So even if the bill were to pass, the city of San Jose would be able to choose how we locally would want to implement it. Okay, all right. Okay, um, one more question on SB 423, uh, which seems like is either cleaning up or making the SB 35 a little bit more powerful, okay? And, and you know that the SB 35, it's got a lot of positive potential for being able to build affordable homes, uh, but there has been some backlash against it. Does this SB 35 enhancement, does that create more backlash in your mind or does it just make it more streamlined and smoother? Thank you, Council Member uh, Jackie morales Ferran, the Director of Housing is heading down. Uh, we haven't yet taken a position on this bill. It's being reviewed right now, um, and Steve can also comment on some of the ongoing negotiations, but uh, we'll let Jackie go first, thank you. Uh, yes, we, uh, the, I'm Jackie morales Ferran. I'm the Director of Housing. And yes, we just started reviewing what this bill would do. I was keeping in mind what the mayor had asked the housing department regarding, you know, how can we think more about lowering costs as we are thinking about trying to create affordable housing. There was an interesting editorial, the New York Times or article, opinion piece, that talked about how we layer to death, and I'm responsible for that as well, uh, on the government side trying to create so many policy goals on particular projects that we in fact grind them to a halt and affordable housing was used an example. I, said all, I say all this because what the bill does is it does make some modifications for perhaps requiring some uh, health insurance uh, for particular circumstances and maybe changing labor requirements which would add additional costs to affordable housing. So if we're thinking about the framework of we are at the point in the city of San Jose where affordable housing is a million dollars per unit. Are we at the point where we're willing to begin to think about what are all the costs that are going into creating a million dollars a unit and what is the most important policy piece that we are driving to in the construction of affordable housing? I think it now poses an interesting question on what direction and what we should or should not be supporting anymore. And so with that, I'll. Those are my initial thoughts upon reviewing the bill, and we still have more work. Yeah, so I, I look at the SB 35, original one, uh, or that that helped in terms of speeding up getting the affordable homes. And today, there's an article in San Francisco, or yesterday, article in San Francisco, how they were able to, by streamlining certain things, they brought the cost of a unit to 435000 So I would suggest that we look at something like that and see if SB 35 modified helps us a little bit in that direction because the affordable homes uh, has been a lot of discussion and the cost 1.2 1, 1, 1. million, 1.4 million kind of thing isn't gonna help us get there, so. 
Yeah, and and I read that article as well, and okay. <laughs> uh, that was allowed because they essentially pulled the affordable housing out of our particular process. So it's that layering of once you accept city, federal funds that add on costs, and yeah. once you go through a tax credit program and it just adds on all these costs. Yeah. They used private financing. They didn't take... Uh, federal, state, local money in order to avoid all of those additional costs, that's what allowed them to move so quickly. Yeah. So, so and, I mean, and that whole question of, uh, in an earlier conversation when you, you had asked, should the housing department be the one, you know, acquiring land, getting us through that process, again, that those are all those things that slow us down versus helping us to move forward, and that's a good example of an ability to move forward, but avoiding what we're all hoping gets a better policy outcome, but takes us longer, more expensive. So, okay, council member, we're, if you have a final follow-up, yeah, go have, ahead. We're at I, 10 minutes. I so have gonna, no follow-up other okay. than to say thank you. There we go, <laughs> okay. that works. Uh, the op-ed Jackie referenced is a very good read for anyone who's interested. The uh, Ezra Klein piece in the New York Times a couple days ago, the problem with the everything bagel approach or something like that. Okay, we're on to Vice Mayor Kame. Thank you. Um, I, I was just wondering, I know that this is the spring report. Uh, in terms of cycle, I know that things happen according to the legislative cycle. Um, and um, uh, I'm just wondering, at what point would be the opportunity to uh, get other things on the docket? I mean, in terms of, because you have such a new council, um, not that the previous council you know, had different priorities, some of them are very similar. I think it's important work, and, and I do also want to uh, recognize and thank you for the briefing that I received and background, uh, but just so that everyone knows that there'll be an opportunity I think it's in the fall, but I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that there'll be an opportunity for this council to also move their priorities forward. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, so the, the cycle that we follow is we come to council three times a year. Um, this is our spring report. We have a summer report that kind of summarizes everything that happened in the legislative um, sessions and in the budget. And then we return in the fall with a new proposed legislative program and legislative principles. Um, that's really the, the opportunity to um, add or take away from this wonderful, lovely book called The Legislative Program. Um, however, if, if there are um, any issues that come up during the year that you want us to look at or are asking the council to take a position on, those, those can be added at any time. Okay, thank you so much. All right, thanks, Vice Mayor. Councilman Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, I just wanna thank the IGR team. Uh, for their thorough and excellent work uh, on pushing, tracking state and federal legislation. I also just want to mention that you've all been extremely helpful to my staff during briefings, as well as when I prepare for the City Association of Santa Clara County uh, to represent the city. Uh, that being said, I do have just a few questions. Uh, my first is, the memo mentions that in late January, the city was made aware uh, that the risk <laughs> profile issued by the Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Emergency Management Agency for the San Francisco Bay Area was unexpectedly dropped from level four to level five. Uh, do we know what the reason for this drop was and is it something that we should be worried about? Thank you so much, council member. We have Ray Reardon, Thank our you. director of the Office of Emergency Management coming down. Uh, Ray Reardon, Director of the Office of Emergency Management. Um, my understanding is that uh, FEMA had the site that they wanted to spread more of the Urban Area Security Initiative funding to additional regions, and so that dropped us down, I think, a 1.5%. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't, know, we don't understand what the future will hold, and mm -hmm. we are fighting against that of, with the local Urban Area Security Initiative. Okay. All right. That, that's good to know. So we don't know how that may impact us in regards to issue of resources or Not at like this that. time. Okay, but we are looking into it and preparing just in case. Okay, no, great, thank you. That was pretty much 
that I was asking for. Thank you for that first question. Um, in regards to the second, um, is there a reason why the city and county of Santa Clara was uh, unsuccessful in their joint application for the United States Department of Transportation Safe Streets for All grant? Um, I know specifically because there was quite a bit of uh, plans for East San Jose in, in that plan. Oh, great. Thank you, council member. We have Jessica Zank, uh, who we've been working closely with on this issue. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jessica Zank, Deputy Director. So um, we did apply for a Safe Streets and Roads for All grant, as you just cited. Mm -hmm. This was the first time that this program was available. And so uh, we you know, followed all of the procedures outlined, but ultimately did not get the grant that we requested for Center Road. We were looking to take the earmark, the state earmark that we got last year and multiply it with federal funding. We did have a debrief, and I'd welcome uh, Zane or Steve for anything that I omit here. We had a debrief with USDOT to see why some of the key reasons that we were not selected this year. And essentially, they said the cost benefit, it was a very, it's a, a lot of work that's needed on Center Road to really make it the street that we think it should be. And the cost of that project is a primary factor that was, um, uh, too high for, for what USDOT was looking for in this cycle. So we are looking at our options to apply more successfully for the next round, which is already open and uh, will be required to submit by July. Well, that, that's great. That's essentially what I was going to ask next, if there's going to be another application cycle. And given the yeah. feedback, I believe we probably have a better uh, idea of what they're looking for. Okay. Yeah, and, and they did also take our feedback, which was that some of the lower cost projects with federal money are very hard to justify doing lower cost projects with all of the paperwork and the timelines that are required. So kind of analogous to the housing conversation going on. So they took that too to see what they could do in terms of you know, reducing process for all of us. Okay, thank you. Um, see that I only have 50 seconds left. Uh, I just wanna thank the staff um, in regards to the priorities, especially because uh, a few of them, I, uh, well, many of them aligned with mine, but especially workforce development um, and positioning and advocating for the city to host a semi uh, semiconductor technology center. Um, can someone elaborate a little bit more about what this center would look like and what that would mean to the city? Thank you, Councilmember oh, Nancy Klein heading down again. We'll just have you in the box next time, Nancy. And while she's coming, just thank you so much for your work. And if, if there's anything my office can do, thank please you. feel free to reach out. I'll sit closer. Um, Nancy Klein, Economic Development, and thank you very much for the question. The, the opportunity uh, comes to us through CHIPS. And uh, the opportunity to have the center would be a lot of money, a lot of resource, a lot of talent. Um, put it bluntly. We were very successful. We went um, through the Obama administration and one of the other pr previous similar efforts to create a next flex, which is on chips and wearable technology, usable technology, which has already uh, uh, resulted in quite a number of very cool advancements. Um, so we have a track record. The, the notion about a semiconductor center, um, we maintain Absolutely true. There is nowhere else in the world that has the ecosystem from innovation to commercialization that we do here in San Jose. The companies, while some semiconductors have moved out of the area, what it takes to think of design and put out um, still remains the strongest in the world right here. So we believe that we can put together uh, a winning proposal and it will take uh, a lot of participation as it did before from the company. So now we're talking to companies and, and engaging. And so the focus of new companies, new patents, new jobs, um, we don't believe we'd see a new fab come out of it, but, but the, the constituents in the ecosystem are um, what we believe could very well be served here. Wonderful, that's really exciting. Thank you all for answering my questions. Thanks, Council Member. 
Once again, I just want to thank you for the incredible work you do. It's been a pleasure to collaborate with you to advocate for our city. Uh, one question I did have was around blight, which is a real challenge in the community. And one of the things I've observed is just the challenges of interjurisdictional coordination. There's so many sites where if it was on city property, the graffiti would have been taken care of weeks ago or months ago, or whether or you know trimming weeds that are now four feet tall because of the rainy, all the rain we had this year, or illegal dumping, figuring out who's responsible for what. And I'm just curious amongst the, I think we have over 200 legislative priorities here, given that this is an issue that has um, risen to the top in the last few years, what, what are we doing, what can we do to get more responsiveness out of our partners, maybe especially in our work with Caltrans? And I'm just, just curious if, uh, if there's, and I'm happy to follow up offline if we need to do more research, but I just wanted to highlight that as an issue area where I, I feel that we could do a better job of pushing other levels of government to deliver the level of service that we need. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, the issues of blight and particularly uh, those that intersect with Caltrans are something that we're very interested in and engaged on. I'm gonna actually have Zane um, provide an update of some of the most recent meetings that we've had. Thank you very much for your question. Um, we met uh, through a, um, a state advocacy day with Caltrans, um, and we went with uh, the deputy city manager, Omar Passens, to talk about a lot of the work on homelessness, but also on addressing blight. Um, and I think we're building more and more solid relationships. In addition, last week, we had our call with uh, the director of Caltrans, Tony Javares, and really thinking through how we can continue to, to partner with them in new ways, and also really working on um, great applications around uh, the encampment resolution grants and things like that. So this is really I, the beginning of, of, of something I hope is a much more robust relationship going forward. Great. I appreciate that, and I, I hope so as well. I think it's really, really important for just civic pride and, and people having trust in local government so we can ask them to engage with us on a variety of other more ambitious projects. Um, and then the other thing, I, I referenced the very large and diverse range of priorities we have. And you, you did highlight priorities in the memo, which, which I appreciate. But I, I guess I'm not sure it's so much of a question as just as I mentioned through the March budget message, I, I do think on these issues that are persistent, significant foundational issues that affect everyone in our community, from homelessness to bringing down the cost of construction on housing to cleaning up our city to promoting public safety. I think we're, we're going to need to be very focused because it just, I mean, I have already seen in my efforts to try to advocate to the state, it just takes this repetition of you just have to be ever present, which is partly Steve's job. Thank you, Steve. But um, I also can imagine with the wide range of priorities we have that it's gonna be difficult for us to really get that level of support and responsiveness if we're, if we're talking across a wide range of issues. So you're welcome to com on, comment on that if you'd like, but I just I wanna continue to be that voice for prioritization and focus. Thank you, Mayor. We, we too really appreciate being more focused. Um, so we will continue to work with the council and, and with your office, um, especially as we come back in the fall with a new legislative program and new top legislative priorities to try and really make the work even more focused so we can really have an impact. Yeah, and just to pick up on that, you know, it's not focused for the sake of focus. I think we're, when you come back in the summer and fall, I think something that would help us, help you have that focus is to know where you see the greatest opportunities to have an impact. And it may not be around homelessness, crime, and blight. It may be, I mean, I know we've just collaborated on letters related to safer streets, and, and we're talking about potential funding for, um, for Lake Cunningham, for example, because there may be some specific dollars that we can go get. But I think it's just important that we're informed about where you see the opportunities to have the biggest impact. Because we have a lot of things we care about, but if you can just help us be better informed on, okay, here are the top five or 10 places where we think we can pull down the most dollars or get legislative change that's gonna really move the needle for us as a city. I think that, that guidance would be helpful. Okay, great, thank you again. Thanks to my colleagues for all the thoughtful questions and comments. I think we're ready to vote. I'm sorry, did we do public comment on this item or did I? Yes. We did, thank you. Let's Jimenez? vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? 
Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes, and I am alone. Cohen? <laughs> Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Aye. Kame? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We're on to 3.5, review of the retirement plans, pension, and post-employment health care actuarial valuations as of June 30th of 2022. And we have a presentation. Welcome, Roberto. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members, members of the public. Uh, I'm glad to be back before you. I know we had a joint meeting with the boards last week. Um, I do have a short presentation. Uh, most of the information you actually heard at your meeting uh, last week. Uh, but again, this has to do with the uh, actuary evaluation uh, performed by our, our consultant, actuary consultant on an annual basis uh, for the purpose of uh, basically uh, determining two things, which are the contributions to be uh, made to the uh, plans for the upcoming um, 2023 20, 24 fiscal year and determine the funding ratio of the plans. Let me just make sure that I get this right. Where do I point this? Uh, can someone help me? There you go. So the first slide um, actually just uh, shows the funded status uh, for the plans. Um, we have four trusts. Uh, the pension plans for police and fire and federated, as well as the uh, other post-employment benefits, OPEP, also known as health care. Uh, if you move to the right-hand side of the uh, slide, uh, it gives you a, uh, a combined funding ratio for both, uh, for the pension uh, that includes both federated and, and police and fire. The funding ratio is 68.4% which actually means as of the valuation date, which is June 30th, 2022, the plans actually have accumulated 68.4 cents of every dollar of benefit that the members have earned through that date. Uh, for the other post-employment benefits, that number is 48.7%, and again, same concept, almost 50 cents for every dollar of healthcare benefit that members have earned through June 30th of 2022. Next uh, slide actually deals with the uh, contributions uh, that are determined based on the valuation. Uh, we included both years, the current fiscal year that is ending on June 30th, 2023, so that you can compare that to the contributions that are expected based on the results of the evaluation report. Uh, for the upcoming fiscal year 23-24, again, if you move to the right, the combined uh, city contributions for both the uh, healthcare, also known as the OPEP plans and the pension plans, for the current fiscal year ending on June 30th, total $468.8 million. Uh, the contributions required for the upcoming fiscal year are $472.2, which is actually a $3.4 million increase, which actually comes out to about three quarters of 1% increase from the current year. So the next slide, uh, I'll try to make sense out of it. I, I also always like to present these uh, slides because the evaluation reports are actually uh, and the contributions that are determined are based on what is known as the actuarial value of assets, which is a separate concept or different concept than the market value of assets. So for example, based on the report, which is as of June 30th, 2022, um, the plans are actually a number of assets as of that given day based on the market results through June 30th, 2022. However, the actual value of assets 
uh, is a concept that was actually uh, is required and implemented by the uh, by the actuaries and the uh, governmental accounting requirements. A and the rationale behind it is to attempt to limit the volatility of the contributions required by the employer. And the reason being that uh, the best example I can give you is for the fiscal year 2021, the plans returned close to 30% rate of return. For the 2022, which is the evaluation for uh, that report, the returns of the plans was actually in the four, negative four, negative five percent. So if we were going to use the market value every year, uh, that can have a, a sizable impact on the contributions that are required from the employer on a year-to-year -year basis. So in order to have less volatility to actually make the uh, budget process probably a little more consistent year-to-year, uh, -year, the actuarial value of assets uh, concept was actually um, implemented, which is nothing more than what we also known or referred to as the smoothing value. So in instead of using just the return for the fiscal year ending on June 30, 2022, what we actually do is we go back five years and actually select and use 20% of the returns for each year for the last five years. So if you take 20% for 2018, 20% for 19, and so on and so forth, when you combine the five years, that give you 100% of returns. But instead of the actual returns for the year, it's a combination of the last five years, which actually limits, it sort of average out the returns over the last five years, so it limits the volatility. So that's the whole concept I'm trying to get you to, to understand here. Um, this is not something that we, you didn't see this in the presentation last week because it's, uh, is a more challenging concept and it's something that we use on the annual basis, but it's to help the volatility uh, of the contributions that also help the employer on, uh, on the budget process. So, next uh, slide. Actually, you did see this, uh, this slide on the presentation last week. And so these are the projected annual city contributions in millions of dollars uh, for the next 15 years. And I cannot emphasize enough that this is strictly based on the fact that, or not the fact, the expectations that the assumptions that are included in the report are to be met going forward. In the meeting last week, you actually saw um, three different numbers. You saw this, which is based on the expected assumptions. You also saw an optimistic approach, which um, actually expected an average of 10% returns over time, and a pessimistic, which actually expected about, I think, a 2.5% returns over a number of years. This is just based on the uh, assumptions, which includes a 6 and 5.8 expected return over time. So you can see that the uh, contributions are expected to uh, go all slowly for the next uh, four years, uh, and then uh, 28 and 29 uh, and 2030 over $500 million, and then at that point, uh, slowly uh, decreasing uh, starting in year 2031 all the way to 2038. Um, that, Mr. Chair, uh, concludes my presentation. Over the years, we have done a, a very good job on making sure that we present to the council uh, the basic issues that we feel and we have been told by council that you are interested in. I'm happy to entertain any questions, uh, not just about the presentation, but any other questions that you may have in regards to the evaluation process. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, appreciate it. And I appreciated the study session we had last week as well. I think it was very informative for all of us. Um, why don't we go to public comment? Soto? Yeah, hello? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, my issue is that the negotiating party that negotiates with the city 
these contracts is the POA, is the police officers union. Now we have a very, very difficult ethical, moral, and legal issue to deal with. I know the mayor just, he wants bad because he made some promises. He made some promises to some uh, POAs. That's cool. No problem. That's politics, right? But this is the negotiating party with taxpayer money. And now the ethics, morality, and legality of them to oversee their own office has been compromised and is called into question. So how are you going to legitimize this conversation with that hanging over your head? You have to address that first before you legitimize any negotiations with that office because they were dealing... I want to know how many fentanyl deaths are attributed to that office. That dope that she was peddling onto the streets? How many citizens of the city of San Jose died as a result of that peddling that dope? That's what I want to know. The mayor's concerned with weeds. The mayor of the 10th largest city in the country with all of these issues, jokes and mocks about how high weeds have grown and how much it needs to be addressed. Well, gee, Mayor, if you're that good, then, hey, I stand corrected. But if you're not, get to work. Clean house. Claire? Hi, Claire Beekman here. Uh, thanks for the words of Paul. Um, me and Paul have had a number of discussions on, on uh, what's going on at the SJPOA right now, and I, I'm really feeling it's important we have a real accountable process how to talk about what has happened with this issue. Uh, good luck on our, on our efforts in that. Um, about retirement uh, plan issues, um, retirement boards, they, they have a really interesting way in San Jose, I've noticed, to help kind of define economic policy and what to expect in the upcoming uh, years for ourselves and help shape. And uh, they've done some really interesting work in that way. Uh, and to at least offer the concepts of how they can help shape things. And so with that in, in mind, um, I wanted to remind that it's kind of a, a regular point of mine that uh, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful of what we can be expecting for ourselves in the years 2024 and 25 in terms of uh, community building, community projects, uh, I think there's a real hope uh, of what we can build together and what's on, what's being planned. And um, it, 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 makes, it makes up a really interesting process in the next few years. So I think what we do in this year at this time to set that course in motion, it's important. And in this era of, of trying to leave COVID-19, uh, let's put our best foot forward and our best ideals forward in how to do that. And let's not talk about ideas of recession. Let's talk about our positive selves and our positive human ideals as how to really get to the years of 24 and 25 that I think, I think we're all waiting for and hoping for. And uh, that also, you know, we don't have to practice disaster capitalism, basically. Thank you. Back to council. Thank you. Councilor Foley. Thank you, and Roberto, thank you for the presentation today and for the presentations that you gave to us on uh, at our study session last week. I'm uh, really uh, happy to see this report. It has some good news for us, and it looks like we're on a fiscally su sustainable path, but I want to remind the council that we are not out of the woods, that we still have tremendous unfunded liability that, uh, that must be paid annually and it impacts our general fund and our ability to do other things with those general fund dollars. So I just wanted to remind everybody of how important it is to keep our eye on, that, on the unfunded liability. And with that, I will move acceptance of the report. Second. Right, thanks. Second by Councilor Davis. Councilor Davis, did, did you have your hand up by any chance? Or are you good? I'm good, thank You're you. You're good, okay. And alone. All right. Yes, um, and alone. Any, <laughs> <laughs> any other 
comments, questions? Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, then I think we are ready to vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Still alone. Doan? Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Aye. Kame? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Thank you. Great. Thank you again, Roberto. Okay. Item 5.1, report on bids and award of contract for major street ceiling. No presentation. Rule. Second. Okay. Public comment? I have no hands. Okay. And I'm sorry, I was clearing the list as I saw a hand come up. So whoever just tapped, I don't know who it was. Councilmember Dewan, go ahead. Do we have any staff here to answer some questions? Yes, we do. Our transportation director, John Risto, is coming. Thank you. Making his way. Good afternoon, John Risto, director of transportation. Hi, John. I, I just got a couple of questions. What is the total amount of miles that District 7 will have for this project? In yeah. this specific contract, it's fairly short. It's the section along Tully Road that is within District 7, and that's probably not much more than a mile or so. And out of the total amount, um, how much money does District 7 have acquired with this uh, repair? So what this contract's worth about five million. So the you in the in the memo you can see all the other roads that are included in that. So I could get you that number by just doing some math. We could figure that out for you if you'd like. We are going to be briefing you next week on all of the roadway paving that's going to happen in the next three years. But I'll get you that number. Perfect. I look forward to your one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Council Member. All right. I think we're ready to vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Hello. Cohen? <laughs> Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Aye. Kame? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. That passes. Okay, we're on to item 7.3, agreement with Valley Water for Coyote Creek Flood Project. And we have a brief presentation. I see the team coming down. Let's see here. Looks like we're uh, we're all set to go. Good. Uh, what is this? Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and Council, members of the public. Uh, my name is Omar Passens. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a Deputy City Manager with the City of San Jose, focused on homelessness. Uh, I'm joined today by City colleagues Andrea Flores Shelton, Deputy Director in Parks, Recreation and Neighborhood Services, and Reagan Henninger, Deputy Director for our Housing Department. We are joined today by Bhavani Yerapotu, Interim Chief Operating Officer for Valley Water. City staff is joined today by senior Valley Water staff to share our collaborative efforts in support of Valley Water's Coyote Creek Flood Control Management Measures Project. The city is working to support Valley Water's project by uh, providing trauma-informed, person-centered outreach, uh, connection to services, and assistance in seeking emergency and time-limited housing. The city will also support by cleaning the construction uh, work zone of debris, uh, and removing unhoused uh, individuals from the, the area of the embatement for the safety, for their safety, and to facilitate successful completion of this important project. Uh, next. The recommendations before you today are, one, execute the agreement with Valley Water for supportive services to individuals living along the uh, Coyote Creek in a certain portion within the work zone. Two, increase the funding from Valley Water for targeted services during the contract term. And three, increase uh, revenues and estimate from local agencies and establish a parks, recreation, and neighborhood services appropriation. I will now turn it over to Bhavani Yeropotu, Interim Chief Operating Officer, 
of Valley Water to provide background about Valley Water's flood management project before hearing from our Beautify San Jose and housing teams about the scope of the services and housing intended to provide uh, support during this project. Bhavani? Thank you, Omar. Bhavani Yerpotu. Um, I am the Interim Chief Operating Officer for uh, Valley Water's Watershed uh, Division. Um, in, in front of you is a slide that is showing sort of our uh, overview of the Anderson Dam Tunnel Project. This is a seismic retrofit project that's been in the works for several years. And um, we are finally at a point where uh, we have already started construction from some elements of the project. And it is under a Federal Energy Regulatory Commission order to uh, complete the project. And in order to meet the timelines of that um, project, there are several sub-projects that are being fast-tracked. And the Coyote Creek Flood Protection Management, uh, Coyote Creek Flood Management Measures Project is a uh, one part of the several projects. Uh, other projects that are already under construction is the Anderson Dam Tunnel. Uh, there is a percolation dam that is uh, used to hold water back to percolate into the groundwater. Uh, there is a capacity restriction that we are working on, as well as some environmental stewardship projects to make sure that that entire creek is not dry during the eight, nine year period of the dam construction. So that kind of highlights Valley Water's priority as the highest priority capital project that Valley Water is executing and the Coyote Creek Flood Management Measures Project, which has a timeline working backwards from October 2024, by which we need to complete the sections of the Coyote Flood Management Measures Project before the tunnel is put into service. So what is the project essentially? It is a uh, project that provides flood protection, mainly through the installation of sheet pile walls on either uh, one or two sides of the creek, depending on the hydrology of the creek, uh, all the way from Montague Expressway to Tully Road. However, the agreement in front of you and the reaches that we are trying to provide for flood protection are more in the central part of the uh, of the. Uh, reaches here between reaches five, six, and seven. That is uh, Old Oakland Road and uh, down to William Street. It is designed for about a 2017 uh, flood that happened uh, on Coyote Creek. So the design criteria is to provide for about a 20 year uh, recurrence interval flood. Uh, it's nine miles long, the entire creek. And then there are two parts to it. There is a first part in the middle part, uh, the reaches five, six, and seven that we are fast tracking to kind of match up with the operations of the Anderson Terminal. And then there is a second part that's going to come right behind a year and a half later that will complete remaining reaches uh, four and eight and the other parts of five, six, and seven. Now to this agreement itself. Typically for flood protection projects, uh, it is not uncommon for us to go in and obviously look at the site conditions and figure out what we need to do to hand over the construction site to a contractor. Um, and in, in most of our other projects like Yagas or Lower Penitentia or Berrius Creek that we've done around the county, uh, we've had few impacts but not as significantly as it is in these reaches of Coyote Creek. A couple of pictures on your screen that show how heavily, heavily encamped this area is. And as soon as we've realized that that's what is uh, going to take, and the particular area and pictures you're looking at is where we need the contractor to stage his equipment to come and um, access for uh, continuing the construction along the creek. Our estimates um, that were done um, just before the January storms are, and, and right after are anywhere between 120 to about 200 individuals in those sections. So it is a pretty heavily encamped area, which is when um, we started conversations with City of San Jose, as Valley Water is not um, a service provider of those types of services. Um, so it's been a partnership in working with Omar and his team. Uh, and I'll now turn it back to Omar. For and now we'll go to Andrea Flores Shelton. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council, Andrea Flores Shelton, Deputy Director over the Parks Recreation Neighborhood Services Encampment Management Program. As you know, PRNS provides a range of services to encourage and enhance the clean cleanliness of the city, and that includes the responsibility for conducting abatements of encampments of unhoused people under certain circumstances. As you know, more frequently, the city has been subject to mandates to abate, um, such as the recent Federal Aviation 
earthquake. Should we get down? I feel like as emergency yeah. folks, we should. Seems like it up. worked, right? The retrofit worked. <laughs> Keep going, EOC dresser. <laughs> Keep going? Yes. Okay. Yeah, why don't we continue for now and we'll check to see if there's any additional information we should respond to. But let's let's go ahead. Unfunded mandates will get you a, <laughs> an earthquake. That's why we need the That is true. Okay, business as usual. Okay. Because I was about, <laughs> all right. Um, okay, we, I was talking about, everyone's on their phones, of course. Okay, um, the city, as we know, has been subject to um, mandates to abate, um, such as recently from the FAA, uh, the directive we got to Clear Spring and Heading, also known as Guadalupe Gardens. And now, as Bavani noted, we have the federal government um, requiring us to improve Anderson Dam which is driving this abatement action in collaboration with Valley Water. This work, as she noted, involves large-scale removal of vehicles, debris, and also moving a large number of people to establish the construction work zone. So our role um, in all of this will be supporting Valley Water's flood um, management project in three main ways. We'll be coordinating the activities during the initial abatement of each designated reach. Note that the subsequent abatement efforts will be led by Valley Water in coordination with city staff after Valley Water's contractor takes possession of the work zone. I'll be taking any updates on the magnitude of the earthquake at any time. <laughs> um, Sounds like a 4.6 in San Benito County. Thank you. All right, um, second. We'll be separating and uh, store, um, sorting and storing personal property in compliance with all applicable pos, um, policies during the abatement. And third, we'll be coordinating security with SJPD during the initial abatement activities, which subsequently security efforts will be provided by Valley Water or its contractors, again, after the um, contractor takes over possession of the area. I'll turn it over to Reagan now for housing outreach services. Thanks, Andrea Reagan Hedinger with the housing department. Um, the outreach services is a major component of the project. Um, the agreement with Valley Water would fund um, a team specifically to do the outreach services in the project area. The first step will be to create a name-by-name -name list of the individuals encamped uh, in the area, which will then give us a better idea of the housing and resources needed um, for the people in the area. Um, but some of the resources that we're planning for already are referrals into our emergency interim housing, as well as time-limited uh, rental subsidy often called rapid rehousing, and also one-time financial assistance, or what we call diversion, and that's uh, for someone who just needs uh, one-time assistance, perhaps to uh, move in with family or friends, or um, even move into their own um, housing option. Forward. Oh. oh, yeah, timeline. Keep us moving. Um, 
In terms of the timeline, city staff will be accompanied by Valley Water to do an initial public meeting near the work zone to share information directly with unhoused residents, answer questions, and have an open direct dialogue about the reasons for Valley Water's uh, flood management project. Then in May, the city will work with unhoused people uh, to get them to move from the zone and connect them to the assistance that uh, Reagan mentioned. In late May and, and early June, that abatement that we talked about will be conducted. After this initial abatement, city contract outreach staff will continue to work with unhoused individuals uh, on connection to services and those housing options that were mention mentioned, including that sort of time limited uh, housing on an ongoing basis throughout the end of the project. Uh, this, this slide just provides a little bit of information about the sort of term uh, associated with the agreement. Uh, it's in the, the council memo, it just provides a sort of basic summary that uh, up to 4.8 million, uh, important to know this uh, resources in addition to a substantial amount of resources that the city of San Jose and Valley Water both invest currently on an ongoing basis to address these issues in our city. Uh, so just know that this is uh, in addition to, to those. And then, Again, we have our recommendations, which I won't read through again because they're, they're in the, the memo, and we would just um, uh, remain here for, let me just make sure, remain here for, for comments and questions as needed. And I'll pass it back to the mayor. Great, thank you all. We'll come back to discussion after public comment. Blair? All right, Blair Beekman here, I'm first. That's not a good sign. <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to hold the fort here as much as I can. Uh, I'm kind of sorry this is happening. Um, the federal dollars that you had for the sewer issues and rainwater stormwater runoff things, that's helping uh, this homeless uh, issue along the creeks that you're gonna be working on. Um, I can't stress enough the, the importance and beauty of uh, government-sponsored encampments themselves. And uh, I thank you that it sounds like you've made, I heard, I thought I heard you saying you're making some efforts to house uh, things for people uh, when you're moving them. And that's an important step. And good communication is an amazingly important step and just good dialogue, just talking with people. Uh, I, I've, I've received, I've heard many compliments in San Diego about uh, San Jose's work with trash issues and 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 dialogue with, with their homeless people and trash issues and, and, and things like that, uh, neighborhood people, to create uh, a good feeling and understandings. And they want to emulate that in San Diego. And they're starting to build city government sponsors encampments to deal with their downtown homelessness issues. So I really suggest in years of study on the subject, I mean, we're doing RV things, we've done uh, safe parking, why not consider homeless encampments and, and government sponsored and all that it offers and can help uh, just offer safety and good services with people. Um, good luck in the steps you're taking here today and just a, a real openness and how to talk about the issue with people and to really work towards some good answers. And uh, that's, that's the important thing that we all feel we're doing, working towards good answers. Thank you. Deb. Hi, this is Deb Kramer with Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful. And I'm support of the uh, efforts to maintain um, the, uh, have homeless people find places and be removed from the construction zone. I have two questions though. One is the financing for this would only be for the period to get to the removal um, of homeless people from the zone. And I understand that the ongoing efforts would be through Valley Water. From having watched the Coyote Creek uh, Trail being built along the Coyote Meadows area, that was not the case where there were still homeless people going around the fence during the construction zone. So my question is, how is that going to be uh, free of people, anybody accessing the area for the safety of all? And then second is, what's the plan for continuing those areas to be encampment-free along the lines of the mayor's effort to have some encampment-free zones? 
So thank you. Back to council. Great, thank you. You know, just before we jump into discussion, I just want to thank our partners at Valley Water for coming together to figure out a path forward. I think it's an example of where we can leverage each other's strengths. I had an opportunity to catch up with Valley Water CEO Rick Callender yesterday and just you know express my gratitude that we're we're finding a strategic way to hopefully, if we do this the right way, and I think the memo from Councilmember Ortiz points to the importance of doing this very thoughtfully learning from our experience at Guadalupe Gardens, making sure we have places for people to go. But if we do this right, we have an opportunity to reduce environmental, immediate environmental impacts, prepare ourselves to reduce flood risk in the future, make sure we're not blocking the important work at Anderson Dam, and get people housed. And so there really, there, there's a lot of potential upside in us coming together and, and leveraging our respective areas of strength and the additional funding from Valley Water. So I think there's a potential for this to be a great win all around, including for our most vulnerable, vulnerable residents. So um, appreciate the memo from Councilman Ortiz. We'll certainly be supporting that. And I will turn it over to him as our first speaker here. Thank you, Mayor. Really appreciate that. Uh, I want to start my first off thank you staff for uh, your attention and work on this very important project I know um, uh, that our creeks are important spaces and uh, they should be safe and, and welcoming to, to us all um, I, I want to start off my comments by just saying that I support the Coyote Creek flood project um, it's great to see us respond unfortunately to the devastation of the 2017 floods and also recognize uh, the changes in weather that had, had brought us the atmospheric river storms earlier this this year um, i'm excited to you know see what will come out uh, of this overall project uh, likewise i share my thanks to valley water and city staff for coordinating the pathway forward to execute this important public safety project um, be it with this project or at the guadalupe gardens um, we're seeing an unprecedented uh, abatement of the unhoused community. Um, and I'm particularly concerned about the scope of work that will take place um, for this project, considering the incredibly short timeline. Um, I think uh, looking at the numbers, we're talking about between 120 to 200 people that will need to be contacted uh, in an attempt to build trust first initially and then get them to understand where they need to move. Uh, and then find a location for them. And that's a, quite an undertaking um, that takes time. Uh, but I, I strongly believe that implementing a strategy that requires transparency and, and oversight as we help our unhoused residents move through a very precarious uh, situation. So given that, you know, I, I've, you know, uh, I, you, I've hopefully, um, as the mayor said, everyone's seen my memo, but I do have a few questions in regards to the, um, the, the project. Given that senior staff had knowledge of this project since 20, uh, August of 2022, um, were we planning on putting in or organizing rapid rehousing and abatement um, since then? Omar Passons, Deputy City Manager. I'll start the process. I, I think that um, what I would say is that since getting that, that knowledge, a few contextual things. We share, all of us as a city, share your sense of urgency around providing that housing. And I would say is that um, the process of determining when there would need to be uh, clearing of the space for a, um, this construction to take place wasn't one that happened like the moment that we first became aware in August 2022. I think it's also important to realize that our the teams responsible for that work were all buried in also trying to deal with the last federal um, requirement. And so it's been a process, I would say, from August to, to towards the end of the year to understand mm -hmm. what that timing was actually going to be like and also build towards this negotiated uh, agreement where Valley Water has been a, a good partner in coming forward with the resource. Let me see if any of my uh, colleagues want, want to add anything to that. <coughs> so, no. Oh, okay. So uh, I would say, I, I think the answer is over the course of the sort of months since August, it wasn't, but when they said, hey, let's all go out and meet, we didn't say in the moment. It, I don't think everybody knew in the moment on August 31st when we met, here's the whole timeline all the way out. So I guess what I'm just trying to convey is the teams worked together over those subsequent months to quickly, to identify as quickly as possible 
when the timeline was going to be. <coughs> okay, no, thank you. And so I recognize and I, I applaud the robust uh, rehousing plan and, and record of abatement activities that were put into place during the Guadalupe Gardens abatement. And I think it's a truly a model that we should follow anytime we're dealing with large scale uh, uh, abatements. Um, ultimately, without a clear understanding of where folks will go, uh, I think we may get stuck in a situation where we're essentially pushing our unhoused residents into the surrounding neighborhoods. And you know what, I, I wouldn't want to do that to my colleagues because then they'll start getting phone calls. You know, we're getting unhoused people in the business uh, uh, corridors, or they're in, in you know vacant storefronts or things like that. So I, I really think it's important that as we move forward, we take into consideration developing these robust, rapid rehousing, <coughs> connecting to services. Uh, uh, strategy. So I appreciate your hard work on this. And with that, uh, I'd like to move my memo, which also uh, accepts the staff recommendation. I'll second. Great. Thanks, Council Member. Um, Council Member Duan. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Valley Water, for the Coyote Creek flood project. And thank you, staff, for working hard and to make this happen. It is said that there will be plenty of communication and outreach um, and that would ensure that the safe there are unhoused residents in the construction zone. In the situation that an unhoused resident is notified to leave due to the construction and given an alternative shelter, yet still refuse to move, do you have any plan to help that unhoused residents? Um, thank you, Council Member. I'm going to go to Andrea Flores Shelton. Thank you, Council Member. Um, we, like we do with many of our joint activities with Valley Water, we follow our abatement procedures. Um, and while that does usually include outreach, um, in this case, we will have sort of an ongoing list of who we know um, we've contacted in the initial. Um, abatement notice and outreach phase and um, continue to work with them. Um, but we are committed uh, with Valley Water to um, understand that we will have to um, support them in um, abating any re-encampment that um, does put the construction zone in a precarious situation. The second question I have for you is, uh, once the unhoused resident, resident is moved and the construction is over, um, where will those unhoused residents reside? Uh, so it depends on the individual. There are a few options that we're working on um, that I mentioned. One is that what we call diversion. It's one-time financial assistance, um, things like family reunification, for example. The other housing option that um, this agreement is paying for is a limited duration housing or it's a limited uh, rental subsidy, like transitional housing. Uh, we call it rapid rehousing in our overall homeless and housing system. The other option is referrals into the city's existing interim housing communities. And then I would add the fourth option is uh, just uh, regular, what I call coordinated entry, that's our everyday housing and homeless system, um, housing people every single day. Um, it's probably will be between 10 and 20% of people will just get housed through the regular coordinated entry system. In this encampment, I should say. Thank you, and, and what is the amount of time when you say limited? Uh... Yeah, limited duration uh, depends on the individual, but the max is two years. And it is including uh, supportive services, so helping that individual um, find and maintain employment, for example. Thank you, and keep up with the good work. Great. Thanks, Council Member. Council Member Cohen? Yeah, thank you. Um, Obviously, this, the flood control project, Coyote Creek, is an important project, and uh, the area with the largest, I believe the area that we're, that, that certainly the one that was highlighted on the map and with the largest number is on the border of D3 and D4, but um, many of the folks are on the east side of the creek, uh, 
in the uh, north of Penitentia Creek. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time in that encampment. I've gotten to know some of the individuals. I know some by name. Um, many of them are housing resistant, the ones who are still there. That, and we're talking about um, large permanent structures and lives they've built in this location. So this is not gonna be an easy abatement. Um, not to say that other sites have been easy ones, but um, you know, we have, we have people who have built staircases and tunnels and, and two-story homes and, uh, and many of, some of whom have collected uh, spent canisters that cover their area. We have a lot of fire issues in that, commu in that area, so this is gonna be a delicate operation. I'm just gonna ask a few questions about the housing resistant there, um, because I know where they're gonna go. They're gonna go down Creek and just east into Penitentia Creek, which is also Valley Water property that has been abated twice and keeps getting re-encamped. These two locations, the one on Coyote Creek and the one on Penitentia Creek, are the ones that generate the most issues from residents in the area who, are, who want us to remove people, and I'm very concerned that the housing resistant will end up just down at, at, at Maybury and, uh, and King in that area along Coy and Penitentia Creek. So I just wanna know what kind of thinking we have about how we're going to prevent this problem from becoming a bigger problem in the neighborhood right next door. Council Member Cohen, Omar Passons, uh, City Manager's Office. So I appreciate the question, and a part, part of the challenge, and I will answer the direct question, I just want, want to contextualize and say part of our, our challenge in this process is the compressed timeline of the, the need to, to manage the federal, um, the federal requirement, but one of the things that we did with Valley Waters help to account for that is add the resources that will allow for ongoing support even after they move. So let's so fast forward post this initial abatement, the the, the team that uh, Reagan mentioned will be able to continue for those folks who they found in one place to continue to go to them in the in in that next location. I, I, I'm going to go to 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 Reagan. I will say also part of the thing that the council has been de deliberating as it moves into the budget season is is what other options for alternatives for folks that might work that are safe and and, and appropriate. That, that may be, um, they may be more inclined to take than, than an actual um, uh, unit. I want to see if Reagan before, I just have, I'm going to add to the question before you answer, Reagan, <laughs> sorry. Um, and, and my question was somewhat rhetorical in the sense that I just want us to be thinking about this and not necessarily that we have an answer at this point. But um, what I was going to suggest also is that as part of the initial outreach, that the outreach includes that expanded zone area that goes down to Penitentiary Creek so that all the folks along that creek are contacted as part of this, not necessarily to say this area is being abated, but how can we provide, off, offer service to the entire area so that as people begin to migrate down creek, the ones who are not service resistant, who are already up river, up creek on Penitentia Creek might take some of the spaces to not make the problem get worse. I think there is an opportunity, council member, to do what you just said, that kind of, that outreach in the surrounding areas. Um, it's helpful for us as we track where people might move to after that initial abatement so we can continue to um, work with those individuals. The only thing I um, would add besides what Omar just said is, um, I think when you offer a meaningful housing option, people are not resistant. And what we're trying to do with this agreement is provide some meaningful options for people, um, not a traditional shelter bed in a congregate setting, um, but more meaningful options like the rental assistance um, and diversion and even referrals into our interim housing where people have a unit of their own um, and privacy, and we have far greater acceptance of those units than of we do when we offer kind of a traditional shelter bed. Uh, fully agreed, and, and I appreciate that. And I, and I will say that even in the, Pen in the Penitentiary Creek area and a few of the people on Coyote Creek, I have spoken to people who are waiting for a meaningful offer. So I'm, I, that's why I'm just suggesting we look holistically at the entire area and don't just focus on that one because they're, they're connected. And people move back and forth between those two locations all the time, um, except for the few that have set up these more permanent encampments. There are, there's a lot of intermingling between those two communities. And so I just wanna make sure we think of it holistically. 
Councilmember Cohen, that's, it's a really good point to Omar Passons. Again, I just, I, I want to make sure to sort of level set um, expectations just a little bit because Valley Water uh, is providing a resource associated with its, uh, we're essentially supporting a project that they have to do because of the federal government. So we, we want to be thoughtful about the resources that remain and how we work that all out. I think our housing department is pretty skilled at, at working on that and we'll take yeah. your those that um, advice as we plan and forward. We, we'll, we'll need to supplement that with our own resources to do this right, is my opinion. I mean, I think we, yeah. I've been asking for that outreach along that creek area anyway for a while, so I mean, I think there's an opportunity to do that. Um, obviously, the timeline's a bit frustrating to me because I was hoping by the time we'd be doing this abatement, some of our EIH sites would be open and ready to house people. We're talking about two to 300 EIH sites that we've been waiting for and that aren't gonna be ready in time for this abatement, so I guess, my question, we can do this quickly, is, is uh, you know, more about the flexibility a little bit as we bring some of these sites online, hopefully, especially considering that one of the sites that we're talking about is within 100 yards of the location we're abating. If we were able to get something up and running there, we, we'd have a much easier time, I think, to start to, to, to address this. So I don't... I think, um, Council Member, I think what I would say is there's a, a concerted effort. I, we saw earlier an announcement of the, um, the governor's interest in providing an option, which is a type of, of, of better option that people can, can be in. We are continuing to push and work with partners. We're actually doing a uh, working with VTA. Again, that's been, I think, re-energized by some, some work that's been done uh, by the, the mayor and council. And so we're, we're going to keep pushing to try to get those up and also evaluate these other quicker options to, to get to your point. It's not happening fast enough and we need to do more, but I, I think I just want to be, make sure you know we're really um, looking at some nearer term options as well. Yeah, I, I know. I just I hope, I would wish the timeline would have come together a little bit better, that's all. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is as we begin the outreach process at the end of April and we, be, and we start to do some um, communication with folks, include my office, let us know when, when things are happening so we're aware, but also if you'd like, you know, if we have the opportunity to join you in some of these um, uh, outreach activities or some of the other communication we're doing, please, please inform us. Thank you. Great point, Council Member. Council Member Batra. <coughs> it, the project seems to be well thought out. Of course, it's mandated from the federal government to do it, but I think the the way you structured the partnership to do this work, it looks like well thought out. I do have a few clarifications I'd like to seek. Uh, we saw in the intergovernmental uh, affairs work that there are going to be 200 tiny homes uh, given under Governor Newsom's plan to city of San Jose. Is that likely to be of any help in this situation? It's all helpful. I, I think there's a big push. I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be too cute with that, Council Member. It, it's going to take a couple of months to be able to get those things up and going and all that sort of stuff. So I would say all of the supply that we can add is going to be of value. We just can't say right here that particular choice is going to make, is going to be the one for these, these individuals. Okay. All right. The, now, this abatement effort. Uh, because of the uh, valley's work uh, or water uh, protection, flood protection need, is this going to be more abatement than what we were planning on doing otherwise? This is an add-on piece of work to our thing, or this is basically whatever we were planning on doing abatements, this becomes a replacement project. I think that I understand your question to be whether this is a, a, a new body of work as opposed to what else we may have been doing. And, and if or I've got, been planning. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so I think that the answer to that question is that this is a new body of work that we worked with Valley Water to, to add that additional resource that we're talking about because, because it's a new body of work. We, I think both the city of San Jose and Valley Water recognized the importance of not... Um, uh, interrupting our ability to provide services and support to uh, the residents that already exist in the city of San Jose and in other places, other parts of the community. And so this is an additional body of work and hence an additional uh, resource. Okay. Now, the question was mentioned before that uh, the residents who are there or the people in the encampment 
uh, they're going to be moved with great care to somewhere. Is that going to be the permanent move for them? Or are we never going to see them back in the camps? Or we have a time-limited horizon to get, get them out of there, get the valley work to do their work, and then wherever they go, they go? The goal, council member, is that we help someone transition to stable or permanent housing. Um, for some people, you can, it's possible to move directly from encampment to permanent housing with the assistance of uh, what we call street-based case management. Um, and we saw that when we demobilized the large encampment at Heading and Spring. There'll be some portion of people um, who will be able to be self-sufficient on their own and they just need a temporary intervention or assistance and that's where the limited duration housing and supportive services comes in is that ultimately that individual will be able to take on the rent themselves. Um, and then some people just need that uh, one time intervention so for example a reunification with a friend or family and that is meant to be their permanent place where they will live but the goal is never that someone returns to an encampment okay okay thank you um now right now you have an estimate of about 120 to 200 people there as of today if not earlier the word would have gotten out Okay, uh, that this is a plan coming and people from there obviously are gonna be given a priority to move out because you got a timeline for that one. Do you have any concerns about more people showing up there, moving there, because you're not able to close the area, it's free movement, and hence it, it making your project more difficult because those people need help. So I'm not going to say that you want to stop them, <laughs> but it does make your project more complex. Uh, Council member, I'll, I'll start and then pass it to Reagan. I, it is true, it makes it more complex, absolutely. And I, and I think what we as a, a city uh, did with, with Valley Water is to say, um, what we're doing with that by name list that Reagan mentioned is identifying people who are currently at that site and, and our teams have been already engaging folks. It, it's, not a, it's not just gonna start after today. We, we sort of see where things are, are going and we have ongoing outreach. Um, but also, uh, it, as noted in the memo, we negotiated with Valley Water to say, hey, this is what we all think our assumptions going in are, but we're agreeing that if we get to the point and we realize those assumptions aren't what's bearing out. We agree that we're gonna go back and negotiate in good faith to, to, to account for that. So I think those are two steps that we're taking to try to be responsible and thoughtful and, and good, good sort of teamwork as we move forward. Reagan, do you wanna, Reagan or Andrea? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I did also wanna mention that we do have um, strategies for deterrence as well, right? This is something we've been testing out this year and we are, um, interested in you know looking at the adjacent areas to um, to the work zone to ensure that you know um, things that we've learned through spring and heading also known as Guadalupe Gardens where um, when when the abatement gets very real and there are kind of boundaries set um, we we did see um, housing outreach become more successful in really getting people um, to take some of these options that had been on the table for some time. And then, um, and then we need to work to make sure that we have some, some we time some of these different deterrents um, to ensure that they don't re-encamp. But there are, um, I, I think we've learned a lot and we know that these numbers that we've, we've asked, Valley Water did an estimate and we've done an estimate. Um, and I think we, we know that once we start doing the outreach, um, th there could be uh, people moving in and there could be people moving out. It really is a fluid situation and we all really wanna emphasize that today, that what we know today may change tomorrow um, and may change the day that we um, after we post and it may change on abatement day. So it is really both a plus, <laughs> it could go up and it could go down. So okay. we would be happy to keep you informed. Great, thank you for that answer. And 
part of the purpose of my asking those questions was so that everybody in the world can hear those that you have given thought to all those items uh, and making this project, getting the flood protection done at the same time, approaching it very humanely to the human problem we have of abatement. Okay. Thank you very much for all the thought you've given to it. And it uh, looks like a project well constructed. And hopefully we have the success of it soon. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Condellis. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to start off by thanking um, the, the staff um, for the presentation, but, but also the collaboration on this. Um, I think um, uh, it's, it's critical that we're working collaboratively, and, and I see Bhavani in the box from my time at Valley Water. Hey, Bhavani. Um, you know, I know firsthand from my time at Valley Water how important uh, this project is, especially as it pertains to the Anderson Dam Seismic Retrofit Project, the formal name, the retrofit of the project. Um, I think these flood management uh, measures are, are critical um, because um, it's going to protect the communities who live along the creek that are largely historically disadvantaged uh, from, from flooding. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I did have some concerns regarding the well-being of our unhoused residents, as well as our neighbors who live adjacent to the actual creek, where the um, uh, unhoused residents will ultimately end up if we're not doing it carefully and with tact. Uh, which I'm, I'm glad for my, my colleagues' questions and, and your presentation. We're doing that uh, diligently, and, and I appreciate your work on this, Omar and team, and, and, and everybody, because um, I, you know I, 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 I think that's, that's important, um, and we, we mustn't lose sight of that, and I'll say it over and over, we have to lead with compassion, um, and, and uh, an emphasis and seeing that the person-centered approach, which I saw in the, in the presentation, is, is critical to, to the success of this, and, and I look forward to completing this critical flood protection project, as well as seeing the Anderson Dam Seismic Retrofit Project complete in the near future as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, council member. I think we're ready to vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? <coughs> yes, sola otra vez. <laughs> <laughs> Doen? Aye. Candelas? Uh, aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Aye. Kame? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks again to our partners at Valley Water. Looking forward to working with you on this. We're on to Open Forum, which is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on anything that was not on today's agenda, anything being city business that was not on today's agenda. I have Elijah and Gail Osmer. I'm sorry. Okay, hi everybody, thank you. I had a group of the unhoused people to join me today, but unfortunately one of the council aides told me to come at 4.30. Well, they didn't make it. I'm here to talk about this horrendous, unconstitutional abatement that the city of San Jose is gonna be doing with our unhoused community at um, D3. Down, downtown uh, Columbus Park, not D3, but anyway, this is what they did. This is a normal abatement, okay? This is a normal abatement. This is what they did by the police. Oh, y'all watching me. So this, they had the police do this. What is this? Where are people gonna go? Where are the RV people living at Columbus gonna go? Tell me, just like the people at, at, at this Coyote Creek, where are they gonna go? There's no services, there's no housing, and nobody is reaching out to them. You know, uh, BRNS said there's 13, there's more than 13. They got the whole place was abated, I mean posted, for Thursday. Where are they going? And why are the police doing this? Isn't this kind of a harassing? This is harassment. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I'm very upset. I rushed down here. Sorry nobody else is here to speak, but I'm just trying to say something needs to happen. I've texted you, I've emailed you, 
this has to be postponed for a dog park. So we want a dog park or do you want people's lives? Most of those RVs don't work. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna crush them. So where are the people gonna go? Who cares? They're gonna be living out on the street with nothing. They won't have a home, they won't have clothes, they won't have anything. Okay, please, please stop this abatement on Thursday. Thank you. Francesca followed by Blair. Francesca. I'm going to move on to Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman. To better practice my words, uh, as there was a recent arrest of an SJPOA executive manager in what is currently being described as a limited pharmaceutical and fentanyl importing and distribution. Like with uh, San Jose Clara, Clara County uh, jail issues and their use of OCLAM, we need a clear, honest account and to openly trace exactly where specific reoccurring cycles of fentanyl use, overdoses and deaths have also been happening in San Jose and in the South Bay in recent years. From all of this, we should be making clear at this time, San Jose advocacy and RIPS efforts to create better community police oversight for the future of San Jose. And it is meant to help address and prevent issues like the current SG, just SJPOA situation. We simply have guidelines and policies developing how local government and everyday community can work together towards ideas of open democracy, human rights, and peace to much lessen the use of war or harm in future policy making and decision making for a local area. It is these good efforts uh, of individual thought at the local level that collectively can help develop uh, future national and international policies of peace before war. And it's with that in mind, um, I just hope to once again describe that, uh, you know, there, we're working on really good policies of reimagine in this country that I think can really help address policies in the Ukraine area that I, I think we were practicing how to ask for concepts of peace and dialogue before Putin invaded. Uh, Ukraine. I'm upset that he did, but since he has, can we return back to an open conversation about dialogue for the future of that area instead of continual war? Francesca, followed by Jill. Francesca. I saw you unmute for just a split second, Francesca. So I think you might have an issue. I'm gonna go on to Jill and we'll keep your hand up, Francesca, and come back to you. Jill. Hi, thank you. This is Jill Borders, District 10. I just wanted to throw out a, sorry, not well-developed thought, but it's something that I think we really should start talking about. I was listening to NPR and there was a program where they were discussing these experts on downtown San Francisco and discussing how, wow, maybe they really didn't think through this whole idea of having just a job center. Um, I know we talk about how San Jose's tax base is really, really um, at, at such a disadvantage due to us being a supposed bedroom community, but I think maybe if we would just sort of flip things around on its head and think a little bit more about how we may be the lucky ones now that we're in the age of Zoom and hybrid working. Our in bedroom community, in fact, might be all of those people that used to leave San Jose for other cities and work, meaning Cupertino, Palo Alto, Sunnyvale, Mountain View, and San Francisco, when in fact now they're sitting here in their bedrooms. So what we might be considering is doing some kind of study to find out what can we do to get these people out from 12 to two to go to lunch here in San Jose since they're sitting in their bedroom working. I really want to have a conversation now about changing the script, which quite frankly, I think is a real positive in here in San Jose that we could turn around, we could use to our benefit. Also, there was a conversation um, that, that the Palo Alto City Council was having saying, 
this is horrible. You know, we're in a situation where we have all of these jobs, all of these great jobs, but all these people are not coming in anymore. So what are we going to do now? We're losing this tremendous, tremendous sales tax. Um, and so I just really want us to say, hey, maybe this is our, I'll, I'll coin a phrase from my daughter, our Taylor Swift moment, where you turn something negative into a real positive. Um, we just might have a gem being a bedroom community with hybrid. Thank you. Francesca, let's try it again. I'm not showing you on a phone, so you need to click unmute once at the bottom of your screen. Okay, I'm gonna go back to council. Um, Francesca, email city.clerk um, and we'll contact you to see if we can help you for the future. Okay, thanks, Tony. Thanks everyone. We're adjourned. Have a great evening.